Well, I'm going to shamelessly bite off this uh, 2.0 thing. I'm going to call this caregiving 2.0, because that's really what we're about here at Be Close. Um, but I'm Mark Hansen, uh, and the biggest disaster of the night for me is that my cell phone ran out of battery, so I can't tweet. But uh, please tweet at me. Um, so quickly start off here. Uh, this is a guy uh, that's far smarter than me. Uh, said a few years ago, it's no longer about detecting what's going on in someone's house. Rather, it's about predicting and being proactive about well-being, motivating behavior to ensure overall wellness. And we couldn't agree more at Be Close. So what's our story? Uh, we're a privately funded startup uh, that we were founded in 2010, so we've been around for a few years here. Um, so we have 12 employees, and we have customers. So that's a big success, right? Um, so uh, you can see some of our partners here uh, who have been great in working with us. And we've been really fortunate. So this space is hot. So you can see all these, uh, these little press pieces here that uh, have picked up on us. Uh, so this is a simple math problem. So uh, I'm going to go through some math here. And this is math that everyone can understand, because I realize that not everybody loves math here. Average yearly cost of assisted living. Kind of take a guess. Anybody have a guess? There's, I know there's some experts in here. $42, oh, yes, 40, about $42,000 here. Uh, average length of stay in assisted living is about 2.4 years. So the cost of assisted living here for the average person is almost $100,000, right? That's a big outlay. Uh, and so the average retirement savings for those 50 to 64, these are people about to hit retirement. Take it, and this is liquid sort of assets. This is something that they could use to deploy for things like healthcare. Anybody want to guess this is in the US? 80,000, so wrong, $26,000. So wow, that's really low, right? So you think about this, 100,000, about 25,000, so that's a $70,000 deficit. That's a big problem, right? So this is a huge opportunity. So, you know, we've seen the, the, uh, the stats here. Within the next uh, even about 15 years here, almost a doubling of the number of people over the age of 65. So the GAO estimate for future Medicare promises, in part, this isn't fully, but in part due to this massive deficit here, 36 trillion, that's 2.4 times GDP. So that's an economic problem that is a big problem that we're facing here. So, and everybody knows this, you know, I'm talking to a room full of experts here, rising the age of population, chronic diseases, shortage of healthcare professionals, increase in healthcare costs, and ultimately an increase in this caregiver burden. So this current care model is hopelessly broken, which is why I called this talk today, Caregiving 2.0. So new care models are needed here. So aging in place makes sense in dollars. And so I'll be here all night with little, you know, tweetable moments like that. Um, but, uh, but certainly what we're trying to do here is keep quality of life high and cost of living low, right? Uh, or cost of care, excuse me. So I mentioned earlier about a $70,000 or so deficit in caregiving. If you can just extend that, you know, the, the amount of time that people can live at home independently, which is where people want to live anyway, you can save more than that deficit. You can actually save quite a bit more, including that extra cost of, you know, doing things like getting home care and other services. So that $77,000 savings, it makes a big difference in people who are living right on that edge and don't have a whole lot of savings. So you think that this is a massive market, right? You know, companies and entrepreneurs are attacking this, wrong. So this is really sort of what we've seen for the last 20 years or so, right? The help I've fallen and I can't get up button. Everybody knows this. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, look at this picture, come on. Like, see Everett Koop, when was he popular? You know, like in the Reagan administration or something? So, um, so 1.5 million panic buttons in use, right? 80% um, of the time, they're ineffective. And don't take that from me. That was actually a British Medical Journal study. So that basically is because people leave them on their bedside table. They don't, you know, they, they fall down. They're incapacitated. They're not with it. So they don't know to push them. Uh, you know, or sometimes people just, you know, they're not quite sure if they're hurt, so they, they don't want to push it. And, you know, they're like, oh, I don't know. And by the time they know they need it, it's too late. As a result, 3 million undetected falls per year. 60% of the time, people spend more than 12 hours on the floor. That's ridiculous. 88% require hospitalization. This is not proactive. This is, this is certainly not passive. This, this solution, quite frankly, sucks. So our vision, which doesn't suck, is to use technology to create a ubiquitous in-home safety net. And that's really important, in-home safety net to enable anytime, anywhere, safety and wellness, assessment and assistance, and connect caregivers to those they care for to facilitate independent living, right? That's a big jumble of words. We're trying to keep people at home where they want to be safe, independent. So how do we do this? So I was really glad to hear Robert talk about the future home. The future, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, certainly with this connected home environment, we're really trying to build to that. 
Um, so if you look at like how we're doing this, we have a whole number of sensors. And so you know, this whole notion of Internet of Things has is, is sort of become a popular phrase. We're really trying to do that. We're trying to take a whole group of sensors, and we're very agnostic to what those sensors can be. But right now, today, we use very passive sensors. This is stuff that the senior does not have to know that's even there. So it watches them passively. It sort of monitors them. All that's pushed to our, our hub here over a, a wireless connection. And then out over, over GSM, or as Robert is going to be very happy to hear me say this, CDMA. So Qualcomm got a little bit of a, little bit of a kick here. You know, we, we're real big friends at Qualcomm's. Uh, and, uh, and so that's how we do it. Be close in a nutshell. This is what we look like. We're the only consumer product on the market. We're cheap. We're a lot cheaper than anything else. We're about a couple hundred dollars up front, about $50 a month. It's like a cell phone, except this is, you know, keeping grandma safe. And so ultimately, I'm going to go through a quick, quick sort of set of slides here. We're now getting to a point where we can actually revitalize the home care market as well. So we're giving these tools to the home care industry. We're helping them sort of reinvent their business model by doing things like they can track a whole number of patients, they can resolve issues, and ultimately that's going to close the care loop and actually improve care at a lower cost. And so ultimately, right, this is all about accountable care management. So that's what we do in a nutshell. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk just quickly about we actually did a home care validation in Canada, $1,200 monthly cost reduction. And so I'm going to end it there, right? The ROI is already there. We're selling to customers. We're in the market, and we're the only consumer-friendly product out there. So thank you. The device looked like a phone. What is the actual physical device? Can you repeat that? Yes. Uh, so the device looked like a phone. What does the actual device look like? I flew through a few slides here because I wanted to fit so much. I was so excited about this, right? Um, but uh, so this is the physical devices, right? So we've got a web interface for the families. And they can log on and track what's happening to their loved ones. And a big piece of our value proposition is that we process all this esoteric data and make sense of it for them. So you don't have to think. Right? It does things like telling you, hey, your sleep time is really off. Like People are still in bed. There may be something wrong. Or there's been an increase in sort of, or your decrease in activity level. That may be indicative of a problem. So it's this notion of Internet of Things meeting big data analytics and ultimately pushing to better interventions. So we have these set of devices for the family. We have a set of devices and sensors that you place in the home. Base station. We have bed sensors. This isn't a complete assortment of the sensors, but we have a number of different types of sensors as well. Quiet care, interestingly enough, so a couple things. One is that we have a variety of different sensors. So quiet care is only motion sensors. And so we actually have a few other different types of sensors, things like bed sensors that get much higher quality data. So when you're just doing a motion sensor, for example, you can only tell when somebody's sort of entering a room or, or doing things in that room, right? We can tell when somebody's in bed and how well they're sleeping. We can do things like figure out when somebody's opening a, a, a refrigerator, for example, to eat. So we get higher quality data, and then ultimately we overlay much higher quality analytics as a result. So quick question for me. The uh, senior VP of uh, ARP, when we had a similar session in Boston, was uh, said his mother would not let him get sensors in her house over her dead body. He would use slightly more rich, colorful language. Um, how do you get people, how do you get past the grandmother saying, I don't want to be monitored, I'm fine. Interesting uh, question. Uh, it is a difficult problem. We don't have a simple answer for that. What we are finding with our customers, so we, if, if anybody is, is curious, we go direct to consumers. So we, we reach right out to that adult caregiving child, typically you know, the eldest child, and typically it's the oldest, uh, oldest daughter. Um, and we try to make that pitch to them. And oftentimes we see about 50% of the time or so they're not able to convince their family members that in fact a system like this is needed. But in, in other instances, I think that you know, they do cite these statistics. Hey, listen, mom, I don't want you to lay on the floor for 12 hours. And unfortunately, there is a little bit of fear-based messaging in there. But I think as we sort of progress as a, as a society and, and, and become more aware of technologies like this, the acceptance and sort of the friction associated with that sale is going to decrease. Uh, so is this, is this targeted at the homebound and what if the senior sort of still drives? We are targeting at this. Uh, to anybody really who feels that their parents need a little bit extra monitoring. And so we have tons of anecdotal stories. This actually sometimes goes into the homes of people who are, in fact, ambulatory, who are going out in the community driving and doing things like that. But let's say they just have you know, a bad evening, they slip and fall, and somebody wants to be made aware of that much quicker than you know, 12 hours from now. We do find that some of our customers, in fact, are, are getting this for sometimes even their parents who are in their early 70s. 
so who are very healthy. Great, great fantastic. Great, thank you. Thank you.